Okay, let's all close our eyes. <clears throat> I want you to close your eyes and just quieten your heart. Lord, we come to you right now, Father, as our loving Father. And we come hungry this morning to receive. And we know, Lord, that your word says that those that shall come hungry shall be fed. And we ask that you feed us with the living word today, Lord. I ask that the word nourishes us, Lord. We ask that the word speaks to our hearts this morning, Lord. Let the word take rightful place in our heart, in the fertile soil of our heart, Lord. That the seed, which is the word which shall be planted this morning, shall be planted deep into that soil. And shall manifest today, Lord, to produce an abundant harvest, Father. A continual harvest, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we quieten our ears this morning, Lord. We open up our hearts. Doing us what you feel needs to be done, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me today. For I am merely your vessel, just a man, Lord, that was willing to say yes <coughs> to your will, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that I stand here as a man, but without any power, without you, and I ask, Holy Spirit, that you minister through me and you have your way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So this morning, this was um, actually a message that I was wanting to, to preach I think just under a year ago, last year, June, and it's not the same message, I've adapted it. And um, it was that one of those Sundays, I think it was the 4th of June, I think it was, the 4th of June. It was when we had the Holy Spirit service that day where the Holy Spirit took control. So in the back of my mind, I was preparing this message and I was wondering, Lord, is it, is it going to be the same? But I think the Lord really wants us to hear this message today because he kept on speaking over and over again. And now is the time, I think, where we should all, and it really be for now, and it's evident that we should all have this message heard now um, because there's power in it. And the scripture, well, the title of my message is Power in Our Testimony. There's power in your testimony. And so much so that Satan will try to convince you otherwise. He, he knows that your testimony is powerful. And he's going to come at you with everything he's got to try to convince you not to share your testimony. He's going to tell you that your testimony doesn't account and doesn't mean anything, that you are not worthy, that if you share your testimony with others, there's a problem with that is it's going to make you more vulnerable. But vulnerability is a good place to be as a Christian. Trust me. We all should be vulnerable and at the feet of Jesus continually because we've got to deplete everything that's in us and everything on this world in order to stand before him and he can pour into us. So vulnerability is a good place. So that's why I think it's so evident for us to understand this. We're going to look at scripture specifically, but I want you to really get this. It's because each and every one of us sitting here outside in this world has all got a testimony to share and it is powerful. All of us have a background. All of us have things happen to us. All of us have had things done to us or we've been involved in things. And that is powerful because in that we can share the testimony and we can in essence tell people where we've come from and what the Lord's done in our lives. And that is why it's so powerful. Our testimony is simply how God is working in our lives, not necessarily how we came to faith. It's a continual thing that's happening in us. It's not necessarily the day of salvation, even though I remember that day like yesterday, but it's what he's continually doing in and through my life. That forms part of my testimony. And it was amazing just this last week where I was able to share what God has done in our lives, in our family's lives, to somebody that's searching for answers. And it was just amazing that as I was sharing that, 
God just made me aware of how powerful a testimony is and how we should all be sharing our testimonies. And the thing is, God's going to put you in places, in situations where that person who needs to hear your testimony will be there willing to hear, but it's up to you whether you want to share with them or not. That's the thing. It is up to you whether you want to share or not. God will position everything specifically, strategically, how he wants and needs it, but it's relying up to you whether you're going to share it or not. Our testimony is so powerful that as I wrote this down, I was just reminded of this. Our testimony is so powerful that you think that you are sharing your testimony to somebody to minister to them. But in essence, what you're actually doing, you're actually empowering yourself. You're reminding yourself of the goodness of God and what He's done in and through your life. How amazing is that? That as I'm sharing my testimony with somebody else that God wants me to share with, I'm sharing my testimony. God's in I mean, being empowered and reminded of what He's done in and through my life. Isn't that just amazing? Isn't that just amazing? That is the God that we serve. Our, test our testimonies need to continually point people to Jesus. The thing is, we've got to be careful because many of us, and I've heard many testimonies of people, many of us have had miraculous encounters, supernatural encounters. Maybe it's this miraculous healing that God's done in your life. Maybe you've been delivered and completely set free from that bondage that ensnared you. And the thing is, we can get so encapsulated by that, that that is our testimony. The thing is, yes, that is important, but remember, who is it that saved you? Who is it that healed you? It is Jesus. So our testimony always needs to be steered in the direction ultimately that the destination is Jesus. If you think about it, when we have an altar call and the people come to the front to give their hearts to the Lord and receive salvation and we ask them to repeat after me a certain prayer and we pray with them, it is not the prayer that saves them. It is Jesus that saves them. It is Jesus that sets you free. It is Jesus that heals you. That is where our testimony is ultimately got to lead to. Our testimonies are not our own. Our life is not our own. They belong to the Lord. That what He's taken through you, or taken you through, is to be used for His glory. It is to use for the people that He needs you to use them towards. We are a vessel, a sacrificial vessel. And the Lord will use you mightily if you are willing. A sacrificial vessel. That literally means that wherever I need him, wherever he needs to me to be, I will be there. I'm a sacrifice. I'm a vessel. He wants to work through me. I'm a vessel. And he's allowed to work through me. And that's how we all should be living our lives. A sacrificed, Lindy mentioned it earlier, obedient life. It's obedient to him what he wants us to do. I want to read to you and I want to share with you. This was an encounter I came across and I was really touched by this and it just reminded me of our lives are not our lives. It's not doesn't belong to me. And I'm going to share an extract and it comes from the book of the Voice of the Martyrs. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. That's an American denomination or non-denominational ministry where they are actually serving persecuted people that are ministering in hostile environments throughout the world. And I'm going to share with you an account written by a lady. Her name was Sister Amber. And she was sent out in the missionary field to go minister to the people in Tibet. To minister the gospel. And I want to just read this and I want you to listen to this account and her testimony which is so powerful. It says here yeah, in 2013 she was arrested by the police. They put her in front of five officers and tried to force her to write her their confession of crimes that she did not commit. Doesn't that sound familiar? Jesus, when they persecuted him, they tried to get him to... Yeah. She prayed and she was close to giving in to their demands when God touched her and told her to write her testimony of coming to faith and all that God had done and through her and to her. At the end of her testimony, she wrote that the reason she was in Tibet was to spread the love of Jesus and even to them. They rejected the writing, ripped it up and forced her to write it again, but she persisted and kept writing out her testimony. And the phys physical punishment came, and in the midst of this punishment, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said that 
They are persecuting me, not you. Will you lend me your body? Will you love them even though they're persecuting you? And from that point on, her punishment did not have the same pain level as before. And she was able to endure the love even though they tortured her. And throughout the torture, she told them that she loved them and that Jesus loved them. And that she forgave them for what they were doing to her. She was eventually released and departed out of the country and she went home and was reunited with her mother. And while Sister Amber was in prison, her mother received a vision of her daughter at the table with the five Asian policemen. And the Lord put this picture on Am Sister Amber Mother's heart and she prayed over this picture not knowing that it was the exact same scene that her daughter was going through at that time. And God spoke to Amber's mother about one of the policemen and he said to her, I've got a very special plan for this man. And Amber was a missionary, not only to the Tibetan people, but she was a missionary to the unreached people group, the policemen who were torturing her. But for her testimony, they would not have heard the gospel. Such a powerful testimony on how God used Sister Amber to reach those policemen. We look at the strife and the pain and the torture that she had to endure, but God looked at the plan that he had to reach that person and what was needed. Apostle Paul is another great example. We can read in the book of, the book of Acts, you can read certain accounts of how he would sometimes in graphic detail like to share his testimony of what he had to and what he endured and what he used to do to persecute Christians. So much so that Jesus had to miraculously come and he had a supernatural encounter and the Lord said to him, why are you persecuting me? He didn't realize what he was doing. It was so graphic, but the need of it was that he had to, when he was ministering to the Jews and to the Gentiles, he had to enforce that as part of his testimony to tell them about where he had came from and what he was before the Lord changed him supernaturally. Let's look at the book of Acts 26. I want you to see this account. The book of Acts 26 verse 9. It says there, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. So he's saying there that everything that I set myself out to do, I did. I indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem, authorized by the leading priests, the authority of the leading priests. I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. That was his goal. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. So he's saying that I was part of all of that. Right until their death, I was there cheering that they should be put to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. So he was sharing yeah, his encounter before his encounter. He was sharing this testimony of his life before he had that supernatural encounter with the Lord at Damascus. Supernatural encounter. So that formed part of his testimony, which was his past. Sharing our testimony is a powerful way for us to share the gospel with others. Powerful way. Your past is your past and we should use that as our testimony when we're sharing with the others. Many people will never agree with you to come with you to church. How many people have you invited to come to church and they don't come with you, do they? How many people have been invited to come with you to do Bible study, to come with you to fellowship groups, whatever it is, but they don't come, do they? But many people, given the opportunity, will listen to the testimony that you want to share and need to share. They will open to and ready to receive that. Let's look at Mark 5 verse 19. These are the words of Jesus. Mark 5 19 says, But Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. This comes out after the time when that man was, who was possessed by many demons was completely delivered and set free. So he was completely delivered. He said to when Jesus was leaving with his disciples, Please, I want to come home. I want to go with you. Let me come with you. To which Jesus then said, no, I need you to stay here. Why? Because I need you to go share what I've done and what has happened to you. 
I need you to go give your testimony to those people that are part of your family. Every one of us that has been saved has a personal testimony. And it is powerful. It is powerful. And if you think about the secular environment, if we look at what's happening in the marketplaces today, that many people will use the power of testimonies to their advantage. How many companies do you know that actually employ, whether it be a famous person, a well-known person, or someone whose life has been changed by a certain product, they give a testimony about how the product, since they've used it, has changed their lives. That I was this before, and now since I've used this product, I am now that. And we all buy into that, don't we? Because it speaks to our heart, because it's, it's personal. And that's the power of testimony. So if the world can see the power in that, why can we not see the power in our testimonies and not sharing our testimonies like we should do? What is keeping us from sharing our testimonies? Is it fear? Is it fear of man? Worrying that we're going to be judged by others. And what are people going to think of me? The problem with us Christians is we like people to think that we are these perfect holy people. And we don't have a tainted past. And yes, we've been redeemed and we've been saved from that. And we're not under the curse anymore. But that past that we had is what God has taken us through. We've been delivered from. It is powerful. Each and every one of you has got a powerful testimony that God has delivered you from. I want you to turn with me to John 4 and we're going to camp in there. John 4 this is about the account of the Samaritan woman that goes to the well where she meets up with Jesus. I love this story because yeah we see this woman going there with one primary objective and that's to go and get water from a well as she would do normally each and every day possibly with her jug going there to get, well, uh, to get water from the well take it back to her village so she can give water to the people in need or whoever needs in her family. But she was going to encounter the living well the source of the living water and he was there and it wasn't by chance there's no coincidence with the Lord let's look at John 4 verse 7 soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her please give me a drink <laughs> I found that ironic Jesus is the source and he's asking her for a drink isn't that just amazing and he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. I want to just stop, stop there. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And you might think, oh, well, that's coincidental. No, it's not. How many times will the Lord put you in a place, in a situation where he's isolated with you, the person that you need to minister or give your testimony to? You might be in a group of people and coincidentally those people move away but the person that you need to minister is left alone just with you and that person it's not coincidental it's the Lord of course then it says in verse 9 the woman was surprised why was she surprised for the Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans she said to Jesus you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman why are you asking me for a drink so yeah we have tradition religion that forbid Jews to speak to Samaritans don't you just love the Lord he just goes straight, straight through any tradition of man, anything that gender that man's put in place, and he cuts straight through that, and he just says, you know what, no, I've got an agenda, my agenda is more important. I'll disregard what man has put in place. I will speak to whoever I need to speak to, because they need to hear. And the amazing thing about the Lord, he's always willing to engage, always willing to talk, always willing, but do we always give him the time? And yeah, we see a Samaritan woman who was shocked that Jesus would even talk to her because of the tradition of man. And then what I love is he actually goes on to offer her, she said, I've come for water, and he goes to offer her the true living water. I will give you true living water. And she had come there to fetch water out of a well, and he's saying, I am that source. I will give you true living water. And then we pick it up in verse 15. John 4 15 says the woman then cries out saying please sir after she had heard the word Jesus saying who he was she says please sir 
Give me this water. I need what you have. I need it. Then I'll never thirsty again, never be thirsty again. And I won't come to get water here ever again. And then Jesus goes on and says, go and get your husband. That is not coincidental either. Because Jesus told her this and she said, but I don't have a husband. The woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands. Sorry, I just lost my place. For you have had five husbands. And even the one married to you at the moment is not your husband. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. Once again, the Lord speaks straight through it. He identifies the sin. He doesn't bypass it and walk around. He recognizes it and he speaks straight through it. And he cuts through it. And he calls it out. And he says, you need to leave that. Stop doing what you're doing. That which you're doing in the dark shall be revealed in the light. And that's the power of the word. Jesus sees it all. Every single thing that we are doing when we think it's in darkness, it's not in darkness. He sees it all and he calls it out. Why? Because he knows that the sin will cause separation between her and him. And he calls it out and he says, stop it. And yeah, we see that the woman has a past, which we all do, don't we? We all have a past, whether whatever, it's, whatever it is, we all have a past. He then goes on to say in verse 25 to 26, he then goes on to reveal to her who he was, that I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. And what I love is the woman didn't even argue, she didn't even question, she just heard him say that and she took off and ran. And where did she go? Let's look in verse 28. It says, the woman left her water beside the well and ran back to the village. That's which what she came to do to fetch water was a primary objective. She laid it down and she ran back to her village. Why? She ran back to telling everybody, the word says. Telling everybody. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? The key word there is telling everybody. That which, which she received, that what was her testimony, she ran off to tell everybody. You see, whenever we get the chance to share our testimony, it is always an opportunity to share with people that we have found the answer. And that answer is Jesus. It is an opportunity. How many people that you just take an opportunity to engage with somebody and you speak to them one on one, and you within a certain amount of time, you will actually realize that they are searching for answers. I'm talking about unserved people. They are searching. There's a need, a desire in them that they are searching for. Understand this. We are all created by a creator with an emptiness that can only be filled by Jesus. Every single person that you encounter and speak to has got that same void in them, whether they know it or not, because they are searching. They are searching for the answer. They are searching for the answer and we know that there is only one way and that is the way, the truth and the life and that is Jesus. And we need to share that with them because they are searching for it. Trust me. I know that. That happened to me. I was searching. Searching for answers in all sorts of areas. Could never find the answer until I found the answer. And that was the Lord. And he filled every single void. In verse 29, the woman told everybody in the city, come to see the man. Come and see a man. She wanted them to see Jesus. That encounter that I've just had, that what is my testimony, I need you to come and see. I need you to have what I have. Turn with me to verse 39. As we come to the crux of the... The chapter and the story, it says in verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. Huh. So she ran back to her village to tell everyone, the word says. And the word says there that many people believed in Jesus because the woman had said that he told me everything I did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. 
See, Jesus wants that. He's looking for the hungry. He's looking for those that want to welcome him in. And then I love this. It says he stayed for two days. Just imagine that. One on one with Jesus for two days. He comes where he's welcomed. He comes where he's wanted. Verse 41 says, Long enough for more, many more to hear his message and believe. Many more to hear his message and believe. And then they said to the woman, <laughs> I love this part of the verse. It says, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us. <laughs> Isn't that just so typical? But because we have heard him ourselves, now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Just know that some people are tougher than others. Sometimes you're going to have to minister to people a little bit longer than others. Some people are so hungry, so hungry, depleted, at wit's end, are so empty that what you offer them through your testimony, they will just receive because that's what they're looking for. But others, they might maybe need a little bit extra time. And you might maybe need to minister to them more and more and more and over and over again. But if you think about it, those people there that said, don't get too high on your horse because not of what you said, but because we saw him ourselves, where did that initial spark of interest come from? Where was that initial seed that was sown? From her testimony, correct? Absolutely. And we must know that there's no authority in our testimony, but there's authority in God's word. There's authority in God's word and every opportunity that we have to share our testimony should be laced with the word of God. For there's power in the word of God unto salvation, the word says. There's power in the word of God to minister to those hearts, to touch those people. We cannot just share our testimony without the word of God. We need the word of God because it's the word of God that cuts through. It's the word of God that penetrates that heart. It's the word of God that leads unto salvation, the word says. God's word is what draws sinners to Christ. That's what it does. It's the word of God that draws us. And what I love is that her past didn't matter. God still used her to do a mighty work and a mighty deed and to touch many people regardless of her past. He still used her mightily. And some people believe straight away the word says there, but many didn't. But she planted a seed. And the seed was watered by the Holy Spirit. And it watered and it produced that harvest and that testimony that she planted in those people's hearts brought them out to believe, the word says. And sometimes we can share our testimony and lead the person to Christ because that person is hungry. If I look at our lives, we were so depleted and so hungry that when the person shared the gospel that I was just ready to just receive because I was completely at wit's end. I, there was nothing left in our marriage. There was nothing left in our lives. And we just needed whatever that person and whatever that person spoke and told us what Jesus could offer. But there are some people that might not immediately receive. And you need to minister them maybe a little bit more, a little bit more. But trust in the power of our testimony. Trust in the power of the word of God. Because those people need what you are testifying about, each and every person. And know this, whenever we get the opportunity to share our testimony and God's word, it's never in vain. It's never in vain. God will use it. God will use it. Stop listening to the enemy. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy that he's telling you, you cannot share that. You are not worthy. Don't share that with them. They don't need to hear that. Minister to those people. Share with them. Because like that, the woman said that she ran back telling everybody, we should be what we've received, sharing with everybody. Why aren't we? I can guarantee you now, if each and every one person that has been saved, that has a testimony, went off and shared their testimony with others, imagine the impact that we will have in this fallen world. I'm telling you now, there would not be enough churches to contain each and every person. But yet we are so isolating ourselves and not willing to share with others our personal story and what God is currently doing in our lives, where he's taking us through. 
the obstacles, the challenges, yes, there are trials, yes, there are tribulations, absolutely, but God gets us through each and every one of them. And that is powerful because then we share that with others. And how many times have you shared or spoken to somebody that that person that's going through something, God has gotten you through that thing and you were able to speak to them and tell them that you have the answer and that is Jesus. How many times? Is it coincidental? I think not. The Lord strategically places each and every one of us in a situation, in a place where he can use us mightily. But the word says that if we are willing, if you are willing to be used, if we are willing to be used as the vessel that is called us to be, we can do mighty things for Christ. And the question you need to ask yourself is, are you willing? Are you willing to share your testimony? Do yourself a favor this week. Go to somebody. Start speaking to somebody. And just tell them what the Lord is doing and done in your life. Tell them that your marriage that was once in shatters and completely desolated, how he came in and he restored that. How your son, who was far from the Lord, and how through prayer, how Jesus turned the heart of your son, or how your daughter, and they came to Christ and they're serving the Lord. How your son, who was set in drugs, who was doing whatever, he's in serving the Lord. Share that. It is powerful. And what he's continually doing in your life, share that. There is power in that. Because I guarantee you now, that person that's hearing your testimony is struggling with a very similar challenge that you have gone through. And you will change them. And you can be there with them. And you can disciple with them. And you can minister with them. And you can bring them to the Lord. You can lead them to the Lord. This part so powerful, family. Do yourself a favor. Take the time. The word says, seek first the kingdom. That's part of the kingdom. That's our responsibility as Christians, to preach the gospel. That's what his commission is, what he's told us to do. To preach the gospel, to reach the lost. That's part of our testimony needs to be involved in that. We've got a family. It's not about us anymore. It's not about us. The world has got us so tainted and so distracted with the things in our lives that we are trying to get over that we focus and distracted by that. And I'm not saying you're not focused or you're not challenged by something big at the moment, that something not coming at you and you should not be concerned. I'm saying that set those things that God has put in your heart and do what he's asked of you. Be obedient. Be willing. And God will use you mightily. I promise you. To touch many people one woman a samaritan woman at a well that went there to collect water in a jug meaningless task meaningless task going to a well to fetch water in a jug not realizing that she was going to encounter a true living source and her life was changed and she impacted a village the word says a village start with your family start with your workplace Start with a close to your neighborhood, wherever it is. Start there, but testify in God's goodness and watch God do mighty things through and through you. Amen? Let's close our eyes. I'm here to tell you that the Lord is not finished with you. He's not done with you yet. He still has a plan for you. A mighty plan for you. And you maybe might feel like maybe that Samaritan woman has just mundane task is just going to fetch water from a well. And within one instant, one opportunity, her life changed forever. And the Lord's looking for willing people, obedient people. And we heard the account of Sister Amber, or how the Lord said to her, don't worry, it's not you they're persecuting, it's me. And he asked her, will you lend me your body? Wow. How many people are willing to lend the Lord their body? Maybe the Lord's asking something big of you. 
because there's a big need that he needs to fulfill in somebody else's life. And that is the Christian way. It's a death to self. Use me for your glory, Lord. How many times do we say that? How many times do we pray that? Lord, use me. Use me for your glory. And then he asks us to go do something. We say, oh, no, I can't do that, Lord. Willing vessel. Whatever it may be. No matter what resistance, no matter what heat, no matter what trials, no matter what tribulations, no matter what pain, no matter what comes at us and what we have to endure. We just need to look at the life of Jesus. And they wanted to persecute him. And they wanted him to confess to all the crimes. And he wouldn't. Because he knew the Father's will. And he had to endure. To sacrifice his body. I'm telling you, no greater love will you know than that. No greater love will you know than that. How willing are each and every one of us to lay down our lives. That he can use us mightily. And I promise you now, to start with our testimony. Just sharing your testimony. With a fellow colleague. With a family member. Whoever it is, someone you encounter. Start sharing with them and watch the Lord work miraculously in their lives. Watch the Lord start to use you mightily because he knows that you can be trusted and you are willing. And the word tells us that he is trusted with little can be trusted with much. But it's in that little and that willingness that he's watching, that he's looking, he's looking for people that are willing. God has gifted each and every one of us with a, a voice. Let's use it for his glory. Let's speak of his goodness. Speak of what the Lord's done in our lives and what he's still doing. For your testimony is continuing. It's what he's working in and through you. Let the fear of man die today. Let the resistance and the fear of man be put to death today, Lord. In each and every one of us. For we shall walk in the fear of the Lord. And that's living a holy, sacrificial life. A life where you can use us as your vessel, Lord. To impact and touch the people that you need to be touched, Lord. stand here today Lord as we heard the word Lord that you quicken our spirits Lord strengthen us Lord encourage us Lord to seek first the kingdom Lord and I pray that each and every person as they depart this morning and as they go their separate ways Lord that you protect them I plead the precious blood of Jesus over their dwellings as a hedge of protection around their dwellings, around their family, around their loved ones. Keep their family safe, Lord. I pray for unity in their families, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that those people in their families that don't know the Lord and don't know you, Lord, that you shall soften their hearts, Lord. Let their hearts be ready to receive the word and the testimony that we shall share, Lord. And what an honor and a privilege it would be, Lord, that we can lead them to you, Lord. Thank you for those opportunities, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name.